We're going through Psalm 119, and it has 22 stanzas, of eight, eight verses each, one for each letter of the Hebrew alphabet. And so we're on the 12th letter. Now what I've tried to do from this is I, uh, I don't just do a study, a, a breakdown of just those eight verses. As a matter of fact, I've only done that once or twice. What I'd like to do is take it and get the message from it, find a, a correlating message in the Bible, and reference it so that it makes a bigger impact on us. That God doesn't just say things once. He hardly ever says them just twice. Sometimes he repeats it over and over and over to get it into our skulls what he wants. So today we will be looking at verses 89 through 96. And our service today, though, is going to be broken into, this part of the service is going to be broken into three parts. The first part is looking at this stanza, similar to what we did in the Bible study. Then I'm going to have a reading. It's going to take a few minutes. And that reading, when you first look at it, doesn't necessarily look like it overlays this passage. But when you start evaluating it, you see where it does. You can see where the truths in this passage are lived out in these people that we're going to read about. And then our third section will be our communion service, because it is the first Sunday. In the first seven, eight stanzas, it was all about praise and worship and glory to God. Then we went through a series of woes and uh, trials and afflictions. And we had three stanzas that kind of dealt mainly on bad things and afflictions and, like I said, persecutions and things going on. But here in Lamed, he begins, and for the rest of the chapter, it's going to be basically good. It's going to be dwelling on the good. Because when you start thinking about God and looking at God, there is so much good in him. So much to learn from him. That the psalmist spends nearly two-thirds of his book praising the Lord. So, in the first section, the first three verses, we look at what I call the supremacy of God. So, in verses 89 through 91, if you want to follow along in your Bibles, I'm going to give you a chance to follow, because this is, until communion, this is the only passage we're going to have. So, once you find it, you don't have to worry about Digging, digging more. Okay? So, and we're also going to help you, is if you want to follow along, we're going to have those on the overheads, uh, the verses. So, if uh, you have a different version, and it's sometimes confusing to try and figure out, because the words don't match, then we'll have them up on the screen. So, let's read verses 89 through 91. Forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. Your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. You establish the earth and it stands. They stand this day according to your ordinances, for all things are your servants. God, the writer here is establishing the supremacy of God. That God is in control. And I like the way it, it says, starts it out. He says, forever, O Lord, your word is settled in heaven. The period has been put. Your word is final. It has been put out, and it is now gospel, the word, the way, the truth, the life. It is it. And then he continues on, um, your faithfulness continues throughout all generations. From Adam until 
Uh, let's see. Can I remember any of these names? Um, Hunter. <laughs> I think he's the youngest one today. Okay? Through all these generations, God has remained faithful. He hasn't changed. He's kept his word. He's kept his promise. He's honored his people. He's blessed his people. And his faithfulness continues. And then it says they stand this day in accordance, according to ordinances. And we discussed that earlier. Was that God's creation has to obey him. The lion can't say, no, I'm going to be vegetarian this week. Uh, I'm not going to go. Okay. Uh, the wind can say, well, you know what? I'm not going to blow on Tracy today. I'm going to let it be hot and sweltering. I'm not going to... The wind can't say that. The rain can't say, well, you know what? Those people are wet enough. I'm, I'm going to stop. Well, the, wind, the rain can't say that. The earth can't say, you know, I'm tired of spinning around. I'm getting dizzy. I'm just going to take a day or two and off from spinning. Well, the earth can't say that. Man says... I'm not going to pray today. I'm not going to go to church this Sunday. I'm not going to read my Bible this week. Uh, I'm not, and God says, I wish you would. But he lets man do it. We are the only part of his creation that can say no to God. And we need to take that seriously. We need to really understand what that is. We go into the next three verses, and we, we're going to be developing in and looking at a personal relationship with God. Because that's what he's going to talk about in these next three verses. And so let's read those. So Psalm 119, verses 92 through 94. If your law had not been my delight, then I would have perished in my affliction. I will never forget your precepts. For by them you have rev revived me. I am yours. Save me. For I have sought your precepts. He kind of reiterates that he is seeking out God. Because he realizes the need to have that relationship with God. And he's trying to impress on us how important it is to have that relationship with God. We want to be able to communicate with him. We want to be able to hear him when he talks to us. And you know what? Maybe, I don't know what it is, but for me, that was an awfully long process. I was really a slow student. It took me years, I don't know how many years, to realize how God talked to me and to be able to know when he was saying something to me. Because I just didn't see it. I just didn't hear it. I didn't even know. It was like he was telling me. He was directing me. It was like the child being led by the hand. Because you could tell the child, go down four aisles, go to the left, go another aisle, go to the right, and there's where the toys are. And the child ends up over in uh, sports or over in gardening. But you take the child by the hand. And now you go down this aisle, now you take a left and show them what the left is, and you go down this aisle and tell them what the right is. The child finds a way. That's what I felt like I was most of my life. God was having to lead me around because I couldn't hear him. It's because I wasn't searching for him. I wasn't getting inside his word enough. I wasn't trying to understand. I wasn't trying to look at all the different ways he's telling me he's communicating with me. So if you have that difficulty, that's okay. Just keep working on it. Keep praying about it. And he's going to then show you and find, develop that relationship with you where you know how he's communicating with you. But you know why it's not easy? Because somebody doesn't want you doing that. We find that in verse 95. The wicked 
uh, this, the wicked wait for me to destroy me. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. Part of that reason for me was that I wasn't kicking Satan completely out of my life. I was allowing him a room in the house. And so I hadn't kicked him completely out. And when you, but when you do that, then you become free and you become that, develop that relationship. But that requires diligence. He reminds us that in the second part of the verse. I shall diligently consider your testimonies. That's not listening to the preacher on Sunday morning and that is the extent of your religion. You're not going to develop a relationship with Jesus Christ and with God, the Father, and the Holy Spirit if all you do is have him for this hour on Sunday morning. It ain't going to work. It's like saying if I was married to uh, Elise and I would say, okay, Elise, we'll see each other on Sunday morning. And then you live over in there and I'll live over here and we're, we're a happily married couple. That doesn't make sense, does it? Because it's not true. <laughs> and it's not true if all we do, if the only time we give to the Lord is right now, then we're going to be surprised. And don't be surprised that you don't have that personal relationship with him. And when troubles and trials and afflictions come, you don't know how to handle them. Or you spend more time worrying. In verse 96. I have seen a limit to all perfection. Your commandment is exceedingly broad. Now when I first read this stanza, I went, to me, and maybe it's just me, but I said, what's that verse doing there? What's he talking about? It, 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 all the other language was poetic and flowing and smooth, and, and now this one seems legalistic or something. There's something wrong. What's he saying here? So I said, well, I could use my old way of determining what a scripture is. I could read it and go on to something else. Isn't that what we do when we don't understand it? Okay, well, I'll go back and say that later. Uh, someday I'll, I'll probably figure out what that means. And we, and we just go on to something else. I mean, I do that. I still do that. Okay? Because I'm doing something else. And then I should, and I wish I would just take the time then to learn it right then. So I said, okay, let me, let me find out what this verse is saying then to other people. And I went to either six or eight different commentaries. Reading what does this verse, what are they saying? What, what's he saying in this verse? And I came across and I said, well, I get, I, get, I think I understand that first part right. And then one of the commentators, and I don't remember which one it is, brought up a great point on the second part of the verse, which I'll share. What I think he's saying is I have seen a limit to all perfection is that God created everything perfectly. But the standard to obtain perfection is so high that we're never going to reach it. God's creation, since sin has entered the world, is never going to reach it again. We're always going to have weeds. We're going to have droughts. We're going to have famines. Uh, there was a little earthquake uh, was it yesterday or day, yesterday? A little earthquake over in the Bay Area. We're always going to have this stuff happening because of, we can't reach it because we have a limit. So we can see and we can strive for this perfection. But we know we're not going to achieve that perfection. But what gives us the reason for continuing to seek and try to become perfect. That's the second part of the verse. Because the one commentator reminded us of the command that we need to always remember. 
His was, love the Lord with all your heart, all your soul, all your strength, and love your neighbors yourself. If you set that up as your goal in life, you're going to get close to that. You're going to push the boundaries out. And the only way we're going to develop that love with God is by understanding, reading his testimony, his word, the gospel, the Bible. Because it will then indwell in us. And then we will want to love the Lord with all our heart, strength, mind, and soul. And we will want to love our neighbor as ourselves. I now want to read a passage of scripture. Actually, it's a compilation. I've gone through and I've taken uh, uh, one book and part of another book. And so I want to sit down and I'm going to read this passage. And then we'll go back and spend a couple minutes seeing how this story overlaps Psalm 119. So if you want to sit back and relax for the next few minutes, if you've got your eyes closed, I won't think you're sleeping. Okay? I usually think you are, but because you're just contemplating, meditating, maybe you can remember some of the, the verses in, the, in there and you'll, you'll remember those as I read this story. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, in order to fulfill the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah, the Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, so that he sent a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and also put it in writing, saying, Thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, The Lord, the God of heaven, has given me all the kingdoms of the earth and has appointed me to build him a house in Jerusalem, which is in Judah. Whoever there is among you of all his people, May his God be with him. Let him go up to Jerusalem, which is in Judah, and rebuild the house of the Lord, the God of Israel. He is the God who is in Jerusalem. Every survivor, at whatever place he may live, let the men of that place support him with silver and gold, with goods and cattle, together with a free will offering for the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. Then the heads of the father's households of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites arose, then everyone whose spirit of God had stirred to go up and rebuild the house of the Lord, which is in Jerusalem. Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and frightened them from building and hired counselors against them to frustrate their counsel all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Then work on the house of God in Jerusalem ceased. And it was stopped until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now, therefore, Tadanai, governor of the province beyond the river, Shethar Bozanai, and your colleagues, the officials of the provinces beyond the river, keep away from there. Leave this work on the house of God alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this house of God on its site. Then I proclaimed a fast there at the river of Ahava that we might humble ourselves before our God to seek from him a safe journey for us, our little ones and our possessions. For I was ashamed to request from the king troops and horsemen to protect us from the enemy on the way because we had said to the king, the hand of our God is favorably disposed to us, to all those who seek him, but his power and his anger are against all those who frustrate him. So we fasted and sought our God concerning this matter, and he listened to our entreaty. Now when these things had been completed, the princes approached me, saying, The people of Israel and the priests and the Levites have not separated themselves from the peoples of the lands. According to their abominations, those of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Jebusites, the Ammonites, the Moabites, the Egyptians, and the Amorites, for they have taken some of their daughters as wives for themselves and for their sons, so that the holy race has intermingled with the people of the lands. Indeed, the hands of the princes and the rulers have been foremost in this, their unfaithfulness. 
When I heard about this matter, I tore my garment and my robe and pulled some of the hair from my head and my beard and sat down appalled. Then everyone who trembled at the words of the God of Israel on account of the unfaithfulness of the exiles gathered to me, and I sat appalled until the evening offering. But at the evening offering, I arose from my humiliation even with my garment and my robe torn. Then I fell on my knees and stretched out my hands to the Lord my God. Now, while Ezra was praying and making confession, weeping and prostrating himself before the house of God, a very large assembly, men, women, and children, gathered to him from Israel. For the people wept bitterly. Shechaniah, the son of Jehiel, one of the sons of Elam, said to Ezra, we have been unfaithful to our God and have married foreign women from the peoples of the land. Yet now there is hope for Israel in spite of this. So now let us make a covenant with our God to put away all the wives and their children according to the counsel of my Lord and of those who tremble at the commandment of our God and let it be done according to the law. Arise, for this matter is your responsibility, but we will be with you. Be courageous and act. Then Ezra rose and made the leading priests, the Levites, and all Israel take oath that they would do according to this proposal. So they took the oath. And the people gathered as one man at the square, which was in front of the water gate. And they asked Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses, law of Moses, which the Lord had given to Israel. Then Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly of men, women, and all who could listen with understanding on the first day of the seventh month. He read from it from before the square which was in front of the water gate from early morning until midday in the presence of men and women, those could understand, and all the people were attentive to the book of the law. Ezra the scribe stood at a wooden podium which they had made for the purpose, and beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Ananiah, Uriah, Hilkiah, and Maaseiah on his right hand, and Padaiah, Mishael, Melchijah, Hashem, Hezbadadon, Hezachariah, and Meshulam on his left hand. Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was standing above all the people. And when he opened it, all the people stood up. Then Ezra blessed the great God, and the, all the people answered, Amen, Amen, when lifting up their hands. Then they bowed and worshipped the Lord with their faces to the ground. Also Jeshua, Bani, Sherebiah, Jamin, Akub, Shabbatai, Hodiah, Maaseiah, Melchizedek, Azariah, Jezebel, Hanan, Pelai, the, Le the Levites, explained the law to the people while the people remained in their place. They read from the book from the law of God, translating to give the sense so that they understood the reading. Then Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God, do not mourn or weep. For all the people were weeping when they heard the words of the law. Then he said to them, Go, eat the fat, drink of the sweet, and send portions to him who has nothing prepared. For this day is holy to our Lord. Do not be grieved, for the joy of our Lord is our strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be still, for the day is holy. Do not be grieved. All the people went away to eat, to drink to send portions, and to celebrate a great festival because they understood the words which they had been made known to them. Then on the second day, the heads of fathers' households of all the people, the priests and the Levites, were gathered to Ezra, the scribe, that they might gain insight into the words of the law. They found written in the law how the Lord had commanded through Moses that the sons of Israel should live in booths during the feast of the seventh month. So they proclaimed and circulated a proclamation in all their cities and in Jerusalem, saying, Go out to the hills and bring olive branches and wild olive branches, myrtle branches, palm branches, and branches of other leafy trees to make booze, that is, is written. So the people went out and brought them and made booze for themselves, each on his roof and in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square of the water gate and in the square of the gate of Ephraim. The entire assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booze and lived in them. The sons of Israel had indeed not done so from the days of Joshua and the son of Nun to that day. And there was great rejoicing. He read from the book of the law of God daily, from the first day to the last day. And they celebrated the feast seven days. And on the eighth day there was a solemn assembly according to the ordinance. 
Now on the twenty-fourth day of this month, the sons of Israel assembled with fasting in sackcloth and with dirt on them. The descendants of Israel separated themselves from all foreigners and stood and confessed their sins and iniquities of their fathers. While they stood in their place, they read from the book of the law of the Lord their God for a fourth of the day, and for another fourth they confessed and worshipped the Lord their God. These readings were taken from Ezra and Nehemiah. It began by Cyrus making a decree that the Jews could go back and rebuild the temple. What was interesting was that Cyrus didn't really understand who God was. He just knew he was a God because he thought he lived in Jerusalem. Well, again, that reminds us again when we know our God, the God we know, is the God of all. And so he is the one who was directing Cyrus to allow the people to go back. But the people who were living in that area, the Samaritans um, and the non-Jewish people, were, didn't want them coming back and bringing this stuff in and rebuilding that temple. And so they manipulated and got word back, and so they got it, so they were the evil. Remember when he said in the one verse that my enemies are around me. And they, they caused the work to stop. And then Haggai decides, you know what, we've got, we've, we, we, this has gone on long enough. We're going to go back and do God's bidding. We're not going to listen to man. We're going to listen to God. God has directed us to build this temple and we're going to build it. So at the same time, when they start to rebuild, they also send an envoy back to the king. And then this time the envoy was successful in getting the cessation order lifted so that they could now legally go ahead and rebuild the temple. But they decided to obey God rather than, and take the consequences. They were going to rebuild that temple. And what was interesting with the guy, he used the word ashamed. Remember when Ezra, they, they got the propagation, you can rebuild the temple again. And the king says, do you want me to send a, a, a guard with you? Since you've got some enemies? And what's Ezra's response? Oh, no, God's going to take care of us. Why did he say Because he said, I was ashamed. I was embarrassed to have accepted a guard when I've already been preaching that... I, our God is so great, he can protect anybody. He said, it kind of make me look like a hypocrite. If I went and said, yeah, why don't you give me a couple of soldiers to escort us? Then when, after, he, what he, after he turned the guard down, he goes, oh my goodness, Lord, we really do have to depend on you now. And he said, so all the, the group with him, they said, they went, they went down on their knees, boy, and they said, oh Lord, you need to keep us safe because your name is on the line. We put your name on the line. We've made a commitment to, for you. God honored it and kept it. But then the response of the people. How the people responded. Can you imagine... I didn't read the, sec the first part. When they were first convicted, it was during a rainstorm. They were all standing outside in the rain listening to Ezra preach. Now, we think if the air conditioning is not working in the building, it's too unsettling. <laughs> Can't go to church, no, no air. These people stood out in a rainstorm. I could make say soaking in. All of God's word. But when he gets up on this podium and he reads, and they said, please read it to us. But guess what? Some of this stuff is hard to understand. How do we apply it? Well, then they had small groups. So as we would get up and read a passage of scripture, and then these other guys were spread out amongst the crowd, would say, if you have any questions about it, I'll answer them. And they were answering the questions. And this went on. What? Day to day. 
And they became so convicted that they start weeping. They're lamenting because they've seen the evil life that they've lived. They've lived, seen how they've deserted God and forgotten about him. And, and, they were, and then they had to go back and say, no, no. This isn't a day for crying. Tears of bitterness. It, days of crying, tears for joy. Because he's delivered us. We're here. The temple's built. We're ready to contact, we're ready to our, dedicate it to the Lord. And then we have a one one half hour service. Well, they had six hour services. Six hours. No, 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 not six hours. How about twelve hours? Six hours, and then they'd go back and do their own six. One fourth of the day was spent. Right here. So you can imagine six hours of just being together, worshiping, praising the Lord, finding out what he wants us to do. Because that's our life application. Wouldn't it be fantastic if churches around the world would have days where they rededicated themselves, much like these Israelites did. Where they came together and just listened and listened and listened and sang and prayed and dedicated themselves, their building, their lives to God. And then partied like there's no tomorrow. Wouldn't, wouldn't that be something? And you bring people in. And remember, who was here? These were people who had been in exile. Some of them all their life. Matter of fact, most of them all their life. Because only a few guys that lived the whole 70 years. We know Daniel was one. And Jeremiah was one. Okay? So they'd live, or they had lived in exile, they had, or they were living in the outskirts, they were kind of living with other people, they didn't really have a church to go to, they may not even have a copy of the law, but they were still Jews, and they were still living in their hometowns, but they really didn't know too much. So what if BCC decided to spread the word to all the diaspora, with all those who've ever set foot in this building. We are going to rededicate this place, our lives, to Jesus Christ. And we're going to set aside a day where we do that. And we're going to have fellowship, we're going to have food, we're going to have music, we're going to have studies, we're just going to fill the day with nothing but praise and celebration to the Lord. Would that be something you guys would be a part of? Do you think that would be something that could maybe energize not only us, but the community and other churches? When they see that a group that's going to say, we are God's chosen people. And we're going to dedicate ourselves to doing that. If you would be interested in maybe getting and setting aside and setting a day and planning a day like this, let me know. Because we'll do it. When I was growing up, and there are still churches today, that have communion services every Sunday. And one of the challenges of that is making it meaningful. And I believe that's probably why most churches only do it once a month, is to make communion meaningful. But even then, I, even when I go to churches that only have it once a month, it is still a rote, it, for most people, and, and it seems like for most of the people doing the service, it's rote. It's just, okay, here's what we're supposed to do. Here's what we're supposed to say. Get the bread, get the juice, drink it, eat it, and then we're done. And I always cringe at that. 
because this is the most sacred part of a service. This is where we are talking directly with the Lord. We're eating a meal with him. He says, you you remember me when you do this. You don't think about the ball game coming up. You don't talk, think about the chores you got to do. You don't think about having to go back to work. You don't think about whether you you feel good or not. You're not worried about tomorrow. The only thing we, we want to center our minds on is Jesus Christ. Who he is, what he's done. And so each one of these services, I want to find something that will give us something to think about about Jesus. So I chose Luke, the 19th chapter, verses 1 through 10. Now this is about a little guy. Okay, this this guy isn't very big. Um, He's uh, vertically challenged. And he hears that Jesus is coming by. So Luke, the 19th chapter, verse 10. Verses 1 through 10. The he when we start is Jesus. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. He wasn't going to stop. He was just going to, this was just a, maybe a pit stop, but that was it. And keep on going. And there was a man called called by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and he was rich. Zacchaeus was trying to see who Jesus was. And was unable because of the crowd, for he was small in stature. So he ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree in order to see him, for he was about to pass through that way. When Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for today I must stay at your house. And he hurried and came down and received him gladly. When they saw it, they all began to grumble, saying, He has gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. Zacchaeus stopped and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my possessions I will give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone or anything, I will give them back four times as much. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. You were lost. You had no hope until you accepted Jesus Christ. And he wants us to remember that right now. So I'm going to ask two men come up. Would you get John? Good John. Yeah. 